anyway, today I'd like to talk a little bit about antibiotic use and poultry management. And, and before we get started, the thing I want to point out is poultry is now the largest uh, item that we eat in the meat aisle. I guess it's not really meat, it's a poultry, but it's the species that we consume the most of in the United States. In fact, we produce about 9.2 billion, a little more than that, chickens a year for meat production. So when you get into that, when we start looking at the antibiotic use and the antimicrobial uses in these, it's important to realize that this is a, you are talking about the species, which is the largest. But I want to give a little bit of history as we go through this. Um, it did work. All right. So since 19 or 2016, when we had the, uh, what do they call that? The veterinary feed directive come through when we started talking about needing feed directives in order to use antibiotics, we have seen and again, these numbers are from 2019, we've seen a 62% reduction in medically important antibiotics used in chickens. And that's huge. Now that isn't something that just happened overnight. It was actually going on a, a little bit before then because we'd actually slowed down and stopped using um, antibiotics as growth proteins over the years. And so it wasn't something we were getting ready for when this came up because we could see this coming down the pipe as it was getting ready to be passed. And we have also seen a reduction in the amount of antibiotics uh, which are not medically important used. And we're going to talk a little bit more about this as we go along. But when we look at that, I, I like to show this, this picture here because I think it's a very good uh, indicator of what we're doing. So if we, if we look at the total amount of antibiotics being used now, the medically important ones, and we look down this list, we've seen that cattle and swine are by far the largest users of all the medically important antibiotics being used currently. Only 3% are being used for chickens and 10% for, for turkeys. And again, as I said, pult, uh, chickens are by far the largest number as far as weight goes. So again, that's very important to see and it's, it's great to see that we're able to reduce those down. There are some reasons for that. I mean, there's species difference between, you know, cattle and swine or mammals, chickens and turkeys or, or avians. So there's some differences there that have allowed us to use less medically important antibiotics. But again, it's a great thing to see. And like I said earlier, we have dropped that number by 62%. And between 2016 and 2019, of which 13% was in the 2018 to 2019. So we're actually getting better at this as we're going along. We're still seeing those production drops coming down. Turkeys, on the other hand, we've only been able to drop at about 15%. And again, only 4% in the last year of that. But again, as we see that, that shows that we're, we're trending in the right direction. We're going down. We're, we're able to reduce the, our reliance on those. And, and there's some reasons we'll talk about in a second off for that. But again, let's look at the non-medically important. Now, non-medically important in chickens, we're still up there. About 25% of them of what we currently use that are non-medically important antibiotics are going to the poultry. The vast majority of that is going to be things like your coccidia stats, which and your ionophores and things like that, which actually they're classified as antibiotics, but they really don't have a an, anal an analog in the human industry or the human medicines. They're, they're kind of an odd item to have in there. But again, we are being able to reduce the amount we use of those as well. Now, our, our success there hasn't been as much. And again, that goes back to mainly coccidia. But you do see that over this same time frame, from 2016 to 2019, we have been able to drop the amount of uh, non and medically important antibiotic use by about 23% and 6% in the last year. For, for turkeys, it's still a little bit less. They are lagging behind. And there's some reasons for that. Turkeys tend to need a lot more loving care than, than chickens. We can get away with a little bit more with them. But you know, to put this in perspective, if we look at poultry over the years, I want to show how this feeds into everything. And, and that is if we start off with the poultry industry, it goes back ah, about 2000, not 2000, whew, can't even talk today, to about 1925 when we really saw the modern poultry industry kind of get its roots and get started. And if we look back at that time frame, it took us 112 days to raise a two and a half pound bird. And it took 4.7 pounds of feed per pound of gain. And our, our mortality was at 18%. That's, that's huge. I mean, that, that's a lot of dead birds. And let's fast forward and look at what it looks like today. In 2020, it takes us 47 days to get a bird that's 6.41 pounds and our feed conversion is less than 1.8, which is fantastic. And that shows you the efficiency we're going through. We will slide on over to the column with the, uh, the mortality. We see that we're still at about a 5% mortality. But the thing I really want to point out on that is if you look and you go back up here and as you look going down the, oops, I've touched that again, it all freezes up. If we go back and look at this, if you look at about 2012, we were down to about 3.7% mortality, and then you see it start to come back up. 
And part of the reason is, is that's about the time frame that we started to see a lot more of this production being done with less antibiotics or antibiotic free production or reduced antibiotics as the companies were getting ready to shift and, and the consumers were demanding this product. And that kind of worries me because that shows that we're kind of a trend there that was uh, an animal welfare issue. And we see that that kind of plateaued at about 5% in 2018 and has stayed there. And it looks like we're starting to get some of those things under control. We see the same type of uh, a pattern in, in our uh, gain. You know, we were going down, we actually came back up, but again, dropped right back down. So again, we are getting a handle on how to handle these different things. And the way that we're doing that goes back to biosecurity. We're getting back to the basics. We're going back to things that we did before we used antibiotics. So biosecurity is one of the most important things that companies are using as an adaption tool. And in a really weird way, the avian influenza outbreak of 2014, 2015 was actually a great wake up call and really assisted us as we, as we started to move forward. We always hear about biosecurity. You hear about it all the time, whenever you have an avian influenza or uh, in swine, let's see, everybody's worried about African swine fever right now. And, you know, in all these different species, we worry about these things. And sometimes it's those worryings that help us to realize we need to focus on this. But the best thing about biosecurity is it's not, it's not disease specific. It works for all the different diseases. We had Newcastle out in California. Well, our farmers saw that. They're like, oh, we better practice better biosecurity. So by seeing the diseases out there and using biosecurity, we're actually able to lower the need for antibiotics because we're isolating our birds and we're keeping them safe and healthy to start with. We've also gone to lower stocking densities. And now it sounds kind of crazy. We've, we've, we've backed up about 10% less birds per house than we used to do. In some places, a little bit more than that even. Now this comes as a double-edged sword. I mean, by lowering the stocking density, we're able to reduce the, the disease pressure, but at the same time, we're also increasing our cost because now we have less birds per square foot. So again, it comes with a little bit of a double-edged sword, but we're able to, to do that and to be able to be effective in helping to lower the need for antibiotics. Another tactic that we're using, or tactic or management tool, I should say, is we're improving housing and management all the time. We're always looking for ways to make things more efficient, make things healthier for the birds. We're looking at ventilation. What kind of ventilation is going through the house? Is the air fresh? How does it feel? Are we keeping things dry? All of these things are very important as we look for ways to prevent disease. And by doing these ahead of time, we're able to prevent the need and the reliance that we've had in the past upon antibiotics. Finally, we do have prebiotics, probiotics, and essential oils. I guess you could put them all together there. Now, these do not replace antibiotics. They cannot be used to treat birds. However, one of the, reason, one of the uses we had for, for antibiotics before we started phasing them out was we would give them at certain times in life when we were going to change feed or they were going to have some uh, challenge in their life like a vaccination. We would use them then to help them get through that time without any disease. Instead of using antibiotics, now we're looking at prebiotics, probiotics, and essential oils. By giving these in a preventative type way, we are able to help reduce the need to use antibiotics as a, as a follow-up or as a, as a treatment if the birds do get sick. So again, prebiotics, probiotics, essential oils, they're good to be used in a preventative way. And that's something that we're doing. The companies have several different programs that they use as they go through these things. And we start off with, you know, we had ABF, antibiotic free production, then we have no antibiotics ever. Kind of the similar type situations just depend on the company and how they market it. But you also have organic that needs to go into that same group because they're all birds that are raised on antibiotics. Now, when you do something like this, you have to have a secondary market for your birds because some animals are going to get sick. What do you do with them? Well, you definitely have to treat them. It's the humane thing to do. So we, a lot of companies will have a secondary product that goes out for those animals. But another solution is, is to come up with one of our companies here that I work with, and, and that's Mount Aaron. And they've come up and they're using responsible animal care, the One Health Initiative. And by doing so, they're able to, to well, I'm going to let Har Harley explain that to you. But she's up next. And, and again, this is my farewell slide as we set off into the sunset. But Harley's now, I'm going to turn the time over to her so that she can share what her company is doing to help with their antibiotic reduction.